Right, it's a minute past, so I think let's uh, let's get cracking. A very heartfelt welcome to everybody participating this evening. Um, uh, thank you, thank you guys for taking the time. South Africa at six o'clock. You get started a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm just going to uh, very quickly deal with some household uh, rules, and then um, we'll we'll get started. Uh, so just so everybody knows, we will be recording the webinar, uh, and everybody will be getting a copy. So so those who registered but who haven't been able to make it will receive a copy. Um, we will also um, make, keep it available in case you want to share it with friends or, or family later on. Um, in terms of questions, please don't use the chat function. It's easier for us if you be so kind as to use the Q&A function. Um, and after the initial presentation, we'll try our very best to deal with all the various Q&As Q that, that we can. Um, there's also the function to upvote your question. So if there's a specific question asked that you'd like answered, please use the upload function and it'll sort of lie on top of the, the pile of questions. Uh, be grateful if you can keep the questions relatively generic, so it'll be applicable to other registrants as well. Um, and afterwards, very welcome with any questions to email us at our normal info at bic-immigration.com email address. So with those formalities uh, dealt with, uh, I think let's move on so I can introduce you to our panelists this uh, evening. So uh, we are very grateful that uh, both Dean and David are joining us. Um, I will leave it over to them in a minute to introduce themselves in a bit more detail. But in short, Dean is the current MD at Genius Premium Tuition. Uh, he's got a degree uh, in the hard stuff, so maths and computer science. Um, very experienced tutor, and he's currently moved from being a tutor to managing um, genius uh, premium tuition, and he's uh, opening up uh, their presence in Cape Town. I believe he's flying on Sunday evening. So very shortly, there'll be in-person tutor sessions being available in Cape Town as well for our Cape Town uh, clients. And then um, David, very grateful that you could join us as well. And Dr. David Smith, is about the most experienced uh, person in this in this game, not due to age, but due to being a massive overachiever, I think, all his life. Uh, you'll notice he's got more uh, letters than the alphabet behind his name, and he's certainly the person to go to when it comes to any form of private schooling for your children and finding them a place in the United Kingdom. So having said all that, uh, Dean, I'm gonna put it over to you so you gentlemen can start your presentation. Thanks, JP. Cool. So uh, the first thing I want to do is just introduce Genius and talk a little bit about our journey and experience in the situation where parents are moving their students from South African schools to schools in the UK. And uh, the, the course of this webinar um, is going to be an identification of some of the common questions and challenges which arise. David and I are going to do our best to give you some very thorough information up front. And then we'll move into the Q&A section. So great, who is Genius Premium Tuition? So the company is a 28 year old company and we've really spent the last 28 years working one-on-one -on -one with families and students with all kinds of educational challenges. Um, a popular one has been transitions and moving students from here in South Africa over to the UK, whether it's into state schools, um, independent schools or UK universities. So we um, have taught 290,000 uh, hours of lessons with students in the last uh, 28 years. And many of those have been with, with, um, within the framework of the IEB curriculum or the CAPS curriculum, uh, as well as Cambridge lessons and then the UK national curriculum. So. What are some of the um, common challenges that parents face when moving their kids over to the UK? Firstly, the determination of uh, what level a student is at. So what I mean by that is a student might be in a grade six or a grade nine in a South African school, but what are they capable of doing or what year are they capable of performing to in the UK national curriculum? So the identification of that, in other words, you might have a grade six student or a grade eight student, but that doesn't mean that they are year six or even year seven, as we'll see that might be necessary 
um, equivalent. They, don't, they might not know exactly the same things that a, a learner might know. So firstly, identifying what year they are performing to. Secondly, um, when they enter the school that they will be joining in the UK, they will be going into a certain year and they will be joining a class where their peers, the people that they're sitting next to, um, have learned a, a whole bunch of things in the previous year that they were in. So the question is, of the, for example, 516 things that a, a learner learned in year five in mathematics, we're now in year six, what would the student who went to a South African school have learned of those things? And, and what will they be missing out on? Um, and then finally, many of the schools, especially the more competitive ones, require that students write entrance tests in order to gain entry into these institutions. And so the preparation um, and, and, and figuring out how to prepare and finding one-on-one -on -one high quality tuition for that preparation can be a huge challenge. Just head over to the next slide here. There you go. So what's the solution? Um, in, in, when we start out with a student, so initially, um, we will take them through a, a pretty rigorous assessment process. So that begins with an initial meeting with the family, the student included, the purpose of which is, is very much um, qualitative and just to get to know the student as a learner. What are their interests and goals? What do they think about the move? Um, what, is, what is their routine uh, uh, set like? What's their habit stack like? And also it gives them an opportunity to be authorized in the process. In other words, this is not something which is happening at me, but rather I'm being given a bit of autonomy and control in this process. The second part of that assessment, which is crucial, is a very quantitative analysis on um, exactly where they're holding in terms of the UK national curriculum framework. So we administer UK-based tests to a particular year once we've determined what the appropriate year is. And we do very sophisticated diagnostics on those tests to see exactly where the students' um, weaknesses lie, what they know, what they don't know, what kind of questions they've been uh, able to answer and what they've been able to generalize from whatever they've learned in school to that curriculum or to those question types and also what they haven't been exposed to before. So once we've identified the gaps, we have um, a team of unstaffed tutors. So we don't outsource. We've come through an extremely rigorous vetting and training program. We work with these guys very closely and we will assemble a team to come out and do one-on-one -on -one lessons to basically fill in the gaps between now and when you leave to go to uh, the UK and to join your schools. Um, we find that, that students having come through this process, firstly, um, a major one which you might not think of in the beginning is just the student's confidence increases. I mean, often students are, are very stressed. They inherit some of the stress that their parents are feeling when scrambling for schools and and um, this residual concern around, are my, are my kids going to be prepared? And with preparation and with the practice, and, and ultimately when they're doing these exams to, at the end of the process to see what level they're on and what they're capable of, just that confidence coming into the new environment where it's already so daunting for a child. They've moved countries, they've moved school, a, a, whole, a whole new set of friends. But to know that academically they're on par can be very powerful and a huge confidence boost. Better entrance test scores um, with preparation typically means entry into more competitive schools. The capacity, because you build in the outcomes, to join um, the correct year, the appropriate year for your age, also opens up a huge array of, of options in terms of schools. It's, it's very difficult, um, as we'll see later on in this talk, to get into a year which doesn't match your age. So an ability to join the correct year because you build in those outcomes makes a huge difference when selecting a school. Um, and then ultimately, once a student is sitting down, thumbs on seats, as we like to say, in that new classroom um, in the UK, knowing what their peers know obviously has a huge academic and life impact on them going forward into the academic year. So I'm going to hand over to David now, who's going to describe um, a little bit about uh, David's myth education. And I think just before to do that, to preface it with um, a comment that many, many students who we've worked with who have um, been through David Smith education's process have just been completely relaxed and, uh, and, and, and found it absolutely um, thrilling and reassuring. And so with that, um, over to you, David. Thank you very much, uh, Dean. Can I just check, is my camera working okay? Dean, yeah, are you good. able? 
is my camera on fantastic okay okay good um very good to meet you all um my name is david as david smith education i suppose would suggest and i'm based just outside of london in the uk and as the little bit of detail there just illustrates my background is working within the uk secondary sector uk independent schools and i did that on the back of having been to a boarding school myself uh, as JP introduced me, more letters, more degrees, my goodness. Um, yeah, I, I'm a historian and uh, I did a lot of academic research and publishing. I then taught for 30 years and in that role I was both running academic responsible uh, teams and also pastoral teams and then ended up running a school as a, as a deputy headmaster. Um, I've got four children so I can relate very much to all of the questions and the issues that you have and my my youngest child is just about to set off to university so I sort of feel I'm almost through the school part now and my central aim in all that I hope I can offer and support you with is to make informed choices and sometimes the routes that actually are going to be the best ones for your children are maybe routes that you may not be familiar with. So I hope I can give you the overall structure of how the UK system works. And then working with Dean and Genius, we can help you to make sure that your child is in the best place to make that transfer. Dean, can we go to the next slide if possible, please? Yeah, the challenge of coming up to the UK, well, you've got to cope with the weather first of all um, but we are northern hemisphere and therefore we are on a very different academic uh, year to yourselves in south africa so our academic year started a few weeks ago at the beginning of september and it runs through to late june early july so that is one of the challenges i suppose that i find i'm having to address working with families coming from south africa but also southern hemisphere locations so how can I support and help you? Uh, sometimes contact with schools can be a little bit difficult, I think, because I am known by a lot of UK schools, particularly within the independent sector, but also just because I'm here in the UK, I can talk in an informed way on your behalf with schools within the maintained sector. Obviously, as in South Africa, there are a whole array of different schools offering a whole array of different qualification routes. And again, as I said a moment ago, I hope what I can do in supporting you is to bring to your attention academic routes, particularly at age 16, 17, 18, which then progress on to university, which you may not necessarily have been aware of. Working with schools in the independent sector, again, they come in all shapes and sizes, and the admission story and journey for admission into UK independent schools can start as early as uh, even when the child is first born. Um, so a lot of registrations are happening a good three, four, five, six years before a child may even start. But that's not the case with every independent school. And again, depending on your circumstances and the stages that you are at, we can work to make sure we've got the right route and also access the admission process on a timely uh, scale for you. Dean, can we do the next slide, please? Yeah, so I hope what I can offer and what will come out this evening as we just go through a variety of areas is I hope that I can share my experience, both from being a professional within the UK education system, but I think also importantly as a parent, I understand the issues and the challenges and doing a jump from South Africa up to the UK carries a variety of pressures and challenges. I hope also, depending on the profile of school that you're looking to apply to, that my experience and also many schools uh, know me very well and a lot of my friends and colleagues are in senior posts in uh, a lot of schools. I hope also that working with your child I can help and support them and give them the confidence which they might feel that they are lacking. Very often a child underestimates how strong and how talented they are. So I hope working with your child I can help them prepare and be ready for any interview process along the way. And as I say, what I'm finding, and I'm working with a number of families from South Africa, and what I find exciting about the work that I do 
is inevitably no two inquiries, no two families are the same. And so lots of different issues and sometimes challenges come up, but I hope that I can offer a sounding board or perhaps from my UK base actually run the admission process on your behalf. So a variety of stages, but we can guide and support you through. Dean, next slide, please. I hope that what I can achieve for you is to simplify some of the challenges of getting to grips with the new country's education system. Also making sure that we are identifying and selecting the most appropriate school for the needs of your child. So it's a very child-centered process and helping you to know early on exactly where you stand and where your children are going to end up. Because a relocation across from South Africa to the UK for your children, in some respects, exciting, but also daunting. So I hope that giving them that reassurance that they will need, yet alone yourselves, we can actually have a really positive outcome and make this the positive move that I know you will want it to be. Great, thanks, David. So I'm going to just run us briefly through uh, the topics and questions that we're going to be talking on and answering today. So firstly, we're gonna discuss the types of schools in the UK and how that compares to the framework that we're all familiar with here in South Africa. Uh, we're going to talk about how South African grades compare to yours in the UK quite a bit um, uh, throughout the course of the talk uh, and then answering the question what year your child will be going into and hopefully speaking to some of the flexibilities but also the inflexibilities um, when it comes to that question. Um, we're going to discuss school boards uh, which is a, a feature in the later years in schools in the UK and also um, Cambridge which many of you will be familiar with how that fits into the picture. We are going to talk about how you can ensure that the students are on the right level we're going to talk about um, some of the more popular entrance tests and just give you an idea of the space that's involved. You'll see that verbal and nonverbal reasoning is a theme that comes up regularly in these entrance tests. And so we're going to discuss that a little bit. It's unfamiliar often to students and parents in the South African scene. And then finally, how to prepare for those entrance tests. And then we'll move into the Q&A. So to start us off, we are going to chat about the school framework there in the UK. In South Africa, we have public schools uh, and private schools. Public schools often referred to as government schools. We do also have Model C schools, which are technically neither public nor private. They're somewhere in between. Um, in the UK, it's, it's a similar structure, but very different language that's used. And I think a lot of confusion comes in um, if, you, if you misunderstand some of the terminology. So, they don't talk about government or public schools in the UK, they talk about state schools. Those are the state funded schools, basically the equivalent to our public or government schools here in South Africa. The alternative to state schools in the UK are private or more commonly known as independent schools. And an elite subset of those independent schools are referred to as public schools which is the polar opposite of what we mean by public schools here in South Africa. So when we talk about a public school in the UK, um, and perhaps David could, could speak a little bit more to this later on, but we're really referring to an elite subset of the independent slash private schools. Over to David, who's gonna run through the various years and, and how the school structure is laid out. Um, yeah, thank, thank you very much, Dean. I think the terminology that Dean has used there really illustrates maybe some of the initial uh, uncertainty about how the UK uh, system works. What I often find is probably the best terminology to use are fee-paying schools and non-fee-paying schools. So the non-fee-paying schools, as Dean explained there, we would refer to as state schools. And state schools are managed in terms of their admission process by a local education authority known as an LEA. So at the moment, I'm working with a number of families and we are talking with LEAs in different parts of the UK regarding the particular uh, admission process that those LEAs work. Independent schools, fee-paying schools, private schools, obviously everything is done directly with those schools. 
Now, what Dean's put up here on the chart, I think, is a really important starting point. And obviously, I would want to know the name and the gender of your child, but probably the first thing I would ever ask is, what is the date of birth? Because in the UK, our academic year starts on September the 1st. So the age of the child on September the 1st is the starting point. So for example, if I can jump straight to the senior section, if we look at um, year seven, year seven is when a child is aged 11 on September the 1st and obviously has their 12th birthday over the next 12 months. So at the beginning of year eight, they would be 12, and they would have their 13th birthday. So in the independent sector, for example, in certain types of school, particularly those that are boarding schools, a common entry point would be in what we would call year nine. So that's when a girl or a boy is 13 on September the 1st. And then the years run through. So at the beginning, we have reception. So those are for children who we might call rising fives or year four or age four, sorry, and then we'll turn five. And then it goes through from year one to year six. So we would refer to that in our maintained state sector as the primary, and then they transfer at age 11 into the secondary. If, however, you're looking at independent schools, You've also then got what we might call junior independent schools, more commonly known as prep schools. So preparing uh, younger students to do the admissions test to transfer to a senior independent school. And so prep schools will invariably have a junior department or a pre-prep. And then they have a prep department from year three up to year six. And then the senior part of a prep school would be year seven and year eight. And then you would transfer to your senior independent school at the beginning of year nine. So as I was saying a little bit earlier, that really is the first starting point because within the UK structure, um, we have our public exam system for GCSE and A-level examination. The GCSE process, and I think we'll probably cover this a little bit later on as well, but just with this slide in front of us, the GCSE process for assessment at 16 would start at the beginning of year 10. So that's the uh, point when a child is 14 on September the 1st, they would go into year 10, they would then do year 11, and the GCSE assessment would be done in the summer of year 11. You would then transfer into year 12 when you would start your a-level courses. And again, a two-year cycle taking you through to the end of year 13 when the assessment would be done. So one of the uh, issues or challenges that we might have to manage is if you are considering coming into the UK where your son or daughter would be in the middle of what we might call the GCSE two-year loop or in the middle of the two-year A-level loop. Next slide, please, Dean. Here we are. So this is the slide I was referring to. So GCSEs is the General Certificate of Secondary Education. And in both maintained schools, so state schools, you would find that the normal profile would be a minimum of six subjects, and it would increase depending on the ability of the child. Some students perhaps might even do 11, 12, sometimes 13 GCSEs. I think a more realistic program probably is about nine or 10 subjects covering the areas that you would expect. So you would have core subjects covering English, maths, and science. That science might be done perhaps in a combined way. So that might lead to two GCSEs as opposed to maybe doing the three sciences separately, which would lead to three GCSEs. The assessments are done at the end of that two-year process, so year 10 and year 11, and GCSEs are then the basis for going on to sixth form study. So what you would find, a UK school would ask, if you were looking to join them in year 12, what we would call the start of the lower sixth form to do A-levels, is they would obviously ask for predictions for your GCSE scores. So obviously students in schools in South Africa, some might be doing GCSEs or IGCSEs, but the majority are not. And therefore what we would need to do is to manage that transition. This is where we work with Genius to make sure that your child is prepared for the demands of sixth form entry, 
A-level study. And again, as part of that process of admission, it may be that your child would have to do a cognitive assessment test, perhaps in literacy, numeracy, verbal or nonverbal. And it will vary from school to school. The GCSEs are important in terms of university applications as well. Students in the UK will apply for university at this time of the year, so the autumn, September through to December, in year 13. And when they apply to UK universities, they will be asked to submit their GCSE qualifications, so the results that they got when they were 16. So the GCSE process, year 10 and year 11, is a building block on which you then make your university application when you are doing your A-level studies. Dean, can we have the next slide, please, on A-levels? Again, similar to GCSE, A-level standing for advanced level is a two-year course of study. Most students will study three subjects. So when I did my A-levels a few years ago now, I did English, history, and geography. And I ended up doing history as my major subject at university. Sometimes a student, particularly if they are a scientist and a mathematician, might do four A-levels. So the three sciences, or perhaps mass, and, uh, sorry, chemistry and physics and mass, and then you have the option of doing an additional mass or a further mass A-level. No subject is compulsory, so this is perhaps one of the unique features of the UK system. For some, it's an attraction. For others, perhaps it suggests that we narrow and focus and specialise too early. So you can choose to do any subjects that you wish for your A-level study. But what I would be able to do is to offer some very clear guidance about what the knock-on effect would be if you were to choose certain subjects at A-level for your university application. So one of the key questions for any student coming into sixth form is do you see yourself going on for a degree course? And if you do, which subject area? And then we can work backwards to make sure that you are going to a school that is going to offer you the right combination of A-level subjects for your future university career. A-levels are completed at the end of what we call Key Stage 5, so another term which perhaps I can just deal with now. Uh, the education of children is broken into what we refer to as Key Stages, so Key Stage 5 refers to 16 to 18 year olds. We drop down to Key Stage 4, that's for 14 to 16 year olds drop down to key stage three, that's 11 to 14 year olds. So any transfer into a UK senior school, you'll hear this term used about admission into key stage three, key stage four, or key stage five. Obviously performance in A-levels, absolutely key for university entrance. And when you apply to university, they will make an offer. Normally it will be conditional based on performance in your three or possibly for A-level subjects. An alternative academic curriculum, which is increasingly popular in the UK, is the International Baccalaureate, which is a much broader based curriculum where students do six subjects and there is some compulsion. So you have to do maths, you have to do a science, you have to do a language. So it's quite a different programme. And again, it's one that some students are very drawn towards. And I work with a lot of schools who offer A-level and IB and also some schools which are just IB schools. Uh, next slide, please, Dean. Now, this is the point that I was making a few moments ago about obviously our academic year. We start in September. So September the 1st is the key date in terms of determining the year of entry into the UK system. So if we just think about the secondary level, if your son or daughter is 11 on September the 1st, they would be going into year seven. If they are 12, they would be going into year eight. So this is why we always start with the age of the child. Now, discussion with schools is going to be influenced by whether or not we are dealing with a maintained school or an independent school. There is more flexibility about year of entry or age of entry into an independent school. And I've worked with a number of students, particularly those who are non-native English speakers. So this is mostly with students who are coming to the UK from the Far East, where it makes sense for a child to drop down a year so they can have extra support to get their English up to a strong level so that they can then access the curriculum for 
GCSEs. With students coming from South Africa, this is a really important discussion to be had in terms of possibly, not because of the English speaking issue, but because you are coming out of a Southern Hemisphere timeframe into a Northern one. So at the moment, I'm working with a couple of families and we are exploring options of perhaps dropping down a year or perhaps delaying admission so that their child arrives in September. But then we need to work out a suitable bridging period before that September start begins. So the year of entry is determined by your age on September the 1st. Uh, next slide, please. Ah, here we are. So this illustrates some of the uh, jumping challenges from southern into northern hemisphere. So if you leave halfway through what would be, for example, your grade four because you were coming into the UK, then you would actually start that September going into what we would call year five. Likewise, if you were to leave grade nine at the end of the academic year in South Africa and come into the UK, you would be going into year 10. But again, the point or the time of entry is really significant because the GCSE process starts at the beginning of year 10. So if you were to arrive, for example, in the January of the year that your child would go into year 10, they will obviously have missed that first academic term of year 10. Likewise, if you arrive in January into the UK and your son or daughter by age goes into year 12, they will have missed the first term of the A-level course. And so again, this is an issue that we can discuss with individual schools and look at options and routes. One family I've just been working with, we've identified a college where their daughter can start in January. So leaving the South African system at the end of grade, coming into the UK system, and they, she will be doing an 18-month A-level course rather than a two-year one. So it's going to be quite an intense period of study. But those options exist to support families coming from a southern into a northern hemisphere. Next slide, please, Dean. Perhaps, David, just before we jump into the next slide, I could, I could just oh, add sorry. something. Uh, not at all. So a common problem for students coming from South African schools. So, I mean, in the ideal scenario, you would have a student who is in grade four and because of their age is completing half of grade four in South Africa and then moving into year four in the United Kingdom. That would be ideal academically because they really will be positioned very well um, mm. to excel when they move into the new school. That rarely happens. More often, we get an almost even split between these two situations. Number one being they complete half of grade four and then have to begin um, year five, for example, or complete half of mm. grade nine and then have to begin year 10. So where they're, they're sort of missing half of a year, um, it can be well thought of. The other situation, unfortunately, is a little more um, dire and becomes a, a serious question when you are looking at schools who take the um, age to year relationship very seriously. And that is when, for whatever reason, because your um, child is in grade four, their age is the correct age for entry into year six, halfway through that year. So you might be halfway through grade four, moving over to the UK and be expected to begin year five. In other words, you've missed half of grade four and year five. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a very difficult situation for parents. And so, I mean, unfortunately, we really do find that it's something like 50% of the time a student has to deal with the situation because of, of, of the difference between Southern and Northern um, hemispheric uh, kind of interpretations of what grade or year the student should be in. So mm. yeah, I just wanted to highlight that as a, as a common challenge. And, uh, and then perhaps over to the next slide where David can maybe talk about some of the, the meaning of that and, and what it results in when you get over to the UK. Yeah. The, 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 the most natural entry points into the UK would be September, not January, not April, but September. But we know that life happens and therefore this is where working with you and presenting uh, your child to a school, we can then discuss the options that might be available. That is certainly very much part of the admission process into the independent sector. The maintained sector 
it can be more challenging and it's linked to the issue of support for funding and the timing of enrollment in terms of the school's eligibility for funding for that school place. The natural intake therefore would be to enter into a school for the September term at the beginning of the academic year and that's certainly very much the case when we look at the student coming in for the GCSE programme or a student coming in for the A-level program. Schools, for all the reasons we can understand, are slightly concerned about a student arriving partway or halfway through what is a two-year program, and likewise for A-level, a two-year program. So in terms of entry points that are going to be uh, very difficult to achieve, and I would guard against them, would be trying to come into year 11 or coming into year 13. Those are the public exam year groups and therefore I think the challenges involved with attempting to do that may be a step too far. It may require that your son or daughter actually steps back a year. Now there are challenges and issues with that in terms of their age and their social structure but sometimes that is actually a preferable route to try to, try to then come into year 11 or year 13. So, as I said at the start, we always start with the child's date of birth and then work backwards in terms of how that works within the UK system. And that's where working with you, we then talk to schools. And obviously, this is where doing assessments and getting a clear understanding of your child's academic ability and level and their ability to access the breadth of the curriculum offered by a school becomes really important. And again, this is where working with Dean and Genius, we can then make sure that we can plug those gaps and build those bridges to make that transition as seamless as possible. Thank you, Dean. If we can go to the next slide. Yeah, thanks, David. Cool. So we're now going to talk a little bit about school boards. Um, we don't really have something exactly like this in South Africa, but I suppose the a good analog would be how a student can finish matric um, having uh, achieved or attained an NSC certificate, either in an IEB school where they're writing IEB exams or um, in a standard um, GDE school where they're writing just um, basic CAPS exams. Um, similarly, there isn't just one A-level that all students write for mathematics in the UK, or there isn't just one GCSE. GCSEs are offered by a number of different um, examination boards, just like A-levels are, are offered by a number of different examination boards. Um, some of the more popular ones are AQA. This is the largest one, I believe, something like 40 to 50 percent of the uh, uh, GCSEs and A-levels in the UK are administered by AQA. OCR is, is um, also one of the big ones. I, I think they have a, a reputation for more rigid examinations. Um, so just in the way that there are differences between an IEB maths exam and an NSC maths exam, uh, there will be differences between an AQA maths exam and an OCR maths exam. Mm -hmm. And then uh, another popular one is Edexcel or uh, also Pearson, I think administered by Pearson. That's right. Uh, f further complicating this um, is the fact that often schools will um, choose exam boards for the various subjects. In other words, you might go into a school, it's not necessarily true that all of their subjects will be administered by one exam board. They might have an AQA mathematics exam, an OCR uh, science exam, and uh, an Edexcel English exam, right? So it, it, that's something to keep in mind when preparing for these, these um, the transition certainly into, into the, uh, the, the A-level course or the GCSE course, and when preparing in terms of past papers and understanding the outcomes that one has to meet. So um, to add to the conversation about exam boards, uh, I'm going to just talk about where Cambridge fits in that. Many of you will be familiar with Cambridge. It's quite a, it's becoming, certainly it's becoming a popular option in South Africa, um, moving your kids into a Cambridge school where um, in the lower years, they might sit checkpoint exams um, or in the later years do what, what they would call IGCSEs, right? So that's an international GCSE. It's what Cambridge refers to as their GCSE program, um, sometimes shortened to IG, 
which is short for IGCSE, which is international <laughs> GCSE. Um, and then popularly in South Africa or commonly in South Africa, we won't do the full A-level course. And so I'm going to describe sort of the difference here and, and how it fits in. Whereas in the UK, a student will take something like eight to 10 GCSEs and then do three full A-levels. That's the full two-year course. In South Africa, to get a South African equivalent matric at a Cambridge school, um, they will do a number of GCSEs and then do AS levels, which is half of the A-level course, also commonly referred to as A1, so A1 and A2. And instead of three, they'll need to take a higher number, depending on the school and, and the requirements. So Cambridge really is just another exam board in this list of exam boards that's been operationalized for international use. Edexcel slash Pearson, that exam board is becoming quite popular in South Africa as well. There are a number of schools online and brick and mortar who are beginning to offer, instead of a Cambridge um, GCSE or A-level, um, Edexcel uh, or Pearson GCSE or A-level. So over to the next slide. Um, when, when a student kind of um, moves into their new school, there are four different sources of gaps um, that are worth thinking about and passing one by one. And so I'm gonna, I'm gonna attempt to do that now. Um, the first one is, as, as, you, as you saw earlier, it is quite common for a student to go from something like year four to grade six. And, you know, it's probably worth actually stepping back and just describing the school structure in terms of the differences between years and grades in order to understand this. A common misconception is that um, year 13, which is when you finish this sort of equivalent high school uh, program, the end of sixth form, is something like grade 12 in South Africa. But the two are very different. Year 13, for sure, is a much more difficult year than grade 12. And grade 12 really is a lot more like year 12. And you can see that um, in the understanding, especially with Cambridge, that the AS levels, which is half of A levels, in other words, the equivalent to year 12 in the UK, is equivalent to a South African matric. So when we talk about going from grade five to year seven, it really is as bad as it sounds. It's not like going from grade five to grade six. The, the two aren't equivalent. And so there is quite a bit of content um, that the student will be missing and will need to catch up on. Even if they're not jumping a full year ahead, they're likely to be jumping a half year ahead. And there are still outcomes that they would have missed in their grade six um, that if they had covered, they would have been more prepared for entry into, for example, year seven. But they haven't covered those because they didn't get to finish the year. They had to make it to the UK in preparation for the September start of the year. So um, even if a student uh, in theory did the full grade six in South Africa and then moved into year seven in the UK, it is true that grade six and year six, so South African grade six and um, UK year six are not equivalent. They're, they're similar, but there will be outcomes that are covered um, in the UK, which we just don't touch on in South Africa. And in fact, there'll be some outcomes which are covered in South Africa, which they don't touch on in the, in the UK curriculum. So there's this sort of mismatch, this misalignment of the expectation in terms of content knowledge that a student has. So that's another source of, of, of trouble. Um, and then in the later years, uh, it, we, we, we sometimes find situations where, for example, a student has taken mathematical literacy and then they're expected to, to go to the UK where um, maths foundation, which is nothing like the mathematical literacy we have. It's not quite the full maths program, but it's somewhere in between those two is mandatory or where the sciences in the GCSE space are mandatory. That can be very difficult if those things haven't been touched. Not even to speak about students who are first language Afrikaans here in South Africa, um, or a first language Zulu, or any other first languages in English, they're gonna have challenges moving into this new framework. I would say in addition to all of that, um, you've, you've also got to understand that even if in theory, the outcomes were the same, a student is being asked questions in a very different way. If this is said often about the Cambridge curriculum, and I'm gonna use that uh, to kind of translate over to the UK national curriculum and the GCSEs and A-levels. Even if the knowledge in theory is the same, the way that it is asked and presented and the kind of thinking that is required is very different. And so the student will, will be missing out on some kind of ability to translate what they know to what's being asked of in the UK. 
Right, over to the next slide. Um, this is to speak a little bit about the solution to that. So I described it briefly. Um, they need to basically write age appropriate UK curriculum tests. And once they've done that, um, especially in the core subjects, that's maths, science, and English. And by science in the UK, so in South Africa, physical science um, refers to chemistry and physics, whereas biology is, or life science is biology. Science generally in the UK refers to physics, chemistry, and biology, the marriage of those three subjects. So um, those core subjects, science, English, and maths, in at least those, identifying exactly what they don't know that they should know when moving into this new space can be very helpful. Um, making a choice as a family as to whether or not you are going to be able to move them into the appropriate year, or if you're going to have to restrict your school selection because there's just no way they can move into that year in the time frame that you have allowed, they can't catch up. Um, in which case you're now clear about they need to go into perhaps um, year seven was the correct year for them to enter according to age, but because of the move, they need to go into year six. Well, that restricts your school selection, but it might not be an option, right? Um, so we've identified these missing outcomes. We now work through those um, as a sort of a target list, um, session by session with a one-on-one -on -one trained tutor. Um, these in-person lessons are available in Johannesburg and Cape Town. Um, and then online, we have many students um, in South Africa and, and, and actually some all over the world who we engage with online. Uh, right. We're now going to move over to a discussion around entrance tests, which is a big one. So I'm going to, to give a, a brief description and then hand over to David in a minute, who will take us through some of, some of the more common entrance tests. Hmm. So these are tests that are required by public schools, which are the elite subset of independent schools. They're required by many independent schools and even some of the more competitive state schools. Sometimes, um, Schools have an internal set of entrance tests, which they administer, uh, and sometimes they rely on external tests, and, and we'll be talking about some of the external tests in a minute. Logistically, what happens often, although not always, is tests will be sent to the student's current school to be administered at the current school under the supervision of a teacher. Um, this is not true for all of the tests, but certainly for internal school tests, that is a popular route to allowing the student to write these exams. So they don't have to come out to the UK and write the entrance tests, right? Cool, over to David, um, who's gonna take us through three key entrance tests. Thank you, thank you very much, Dean. Um, the first one we're gonna talk about is UKSET. So this is a very common assessment used by UK independent schools. And this is what it stands for, UK independent schools entry tests. And UKSET is designed to assess your child's ability in verbal reasoning, nonverbal reasoning, mathematical reasoning, reading, listening, and essay writing. So it's not an assessment that you can revise for. It's not a knowledge base, but it's about cognition. It's about speed of processing and the ability of the child, for example, in say a non-verbal exercise, and I think Dean's going to share some with you to see how you can uh, respond yourself. The ability to see patterns, sequences, and obviously then identify what the next natural order would be within that pattern. So UKSET is often asked for by UK independent schools, particularly in those areas of the world where the child would not be using English as their first language. So it also includes a English comprehension and English speaking in terms of the child's ability to communicate. So in applying to UK independent schools, what we would need to identify is whether or not the school in question wants UKSET as part of the registration process. If they don't require UKSET, we then need to ensure that we understand the assessment type for that school. Some will use some standardized UK uh, companies for the formulation of those assessments. Some schools will create their own bespoke assessments. So overseas candidates, as Dean was saying, you're not expected to come up to the UK. And so these assessments can be completed at registered centres. Most schools will use British Council offices. So at the moment, I'm in negotiation with British Council in various locations for assessments for students who are currently going through year 12 admission process. And so UKSET is a result that's added to your CV, your academic profile, alongside the references from your current school. 
So that's the first type of assessment. So we call that Yuki-set. Dean, next slide, please. ISEB is, stands for the Independent School Examination Board. And this produces assessment tests that are used by UK senior schools in assessing students who want to enter in year nine at age 13. And we call that common entrance. So common entrance is an assessment that is done in the June, so for us the summer, of a child in year eight. But what you will very often find for UK independent schools is that the process of admission starts anything up to three, four years before, with registration being done at the end of year five, assessments, initial pre-assessments being done at the beginning of year six, and those assessments would be done with assessments through companies like ISEB or UKISET, but those are preliminary assessments to determine whether or not an offer of a place is going to be made, and those offers are normally conditional upon completion of common entrance assessment in year eight. But like all admission processes, the independent school sector don't want to have a system whereby a child goes through to age 13, does exams, and then is told that they can't progress in the September to the school of their choice. So pre-assessment testing is a very common feature of UK independent schools, and this is where my key advice working with families in different locations is that if you are thinking of certain UK independent schools, then registration is a process that is done three years in advance of point of entry. So, for example, if a family came to me and said, we want to do admission for year nine, so that's with a 13-year-old for September 2022, there are certain schools now that we would be too late to start that process with. Not all, but certain schools have an admission process that will start at least three years out. So common entrance is a confirmatory process, really, of probably a pre-assessment process that has started back in year six. OK, next slide, please, Dean. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, there we are. Cat four. Um, CAT4, again, these are cognitive assessment tests which some independent schools will use. Um, the other term that's sometimes used is what we call 11 plus. Um, 11 plus exam tests which are about retained knowledge. CAT4, though, is about identifying a child's academic potential. Children aged between 6 to 17 can write these assessment tests, and a little bit like the UKSS assessment, they cover areas such as verbal, non-verbal, uh, quantitative, and spatial reasoning. Um, oh, sorry, there's just a message coming there. So again, depending on the independent school that we identify as the most appropriate for your child, it may be that they actually are requested to do CAT4 assessments. And again, those can obviously be done remotely, and then those score assessments submitted to the school as part of the registration and application process. Great. Thanks, David. Um, Thank you, I think just, just to add on to something you said earlier about um, some of the more selective independent schools yes. requiring entry three years in advance, just to speak a little about, um, if I can just head back here, the common entrance exams, not the 13 plus, but the 11 plus exams, um, where these are these are written for entry very far in advance into year nine, um, or and that would be in the more selective schools, or entry into year seven um, for mm -hmm. the following year. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. And in fact, what, what I might just add here, because inevitably London is a very popular destination for relocation into the UK. And the 11 plus entry into uh, senior independent schools, so these are schools that start from year seven, that process of registration would start in year five, and then the assessments would be done during that first term. So at this point, during year six. So again, if you were considering a move and you are hoping for admission into a London independent day school, the key advice I would give is as far as possible, 
is to work backwards in terms of time scale. If you are looking at doing an 11 plus exam, that process would happen during year six. So it's a good year and a half out that we would need to be doing registration and then assessments being done during the autumn term of our year six. So that is when a child is 10 in preparation for transfer when they are 11. Perfect, thank you. Cool, so in these tests, um, what's come up quite often is the uh, requirement of, writ of writing verbal and nonverbal reasoning tests. So I'm going to basically jump forward here to a description briefly of these tests and then an opportunity um, for parents to try some at home. So um, these are psychometric type questions. In theory, these are not questions which um, with practice one can improve on, but the reality is the first couple of rights of these psychometric um, type questions, you're unfamiliar with the question types, um, you haven't developed a strategy, you haven't thought very much about these kinds of, of structures before. And so the reality is practice and preparation for these question types can be very helpful in elevating a student's uh, score. Um, in addition to that, unless students have written very specific kind of psychometric or psychoeducational assessments, they won't have been pre-exposed to these kinds of questions. These are not exactly math questions and they're not exactly English questions. So. We are going to run through initially um, two uh, uh, nonverbal reasoning question types, and I'm going to jump over to the next slide and start a 60 second timer. And I'm hoping that everyone at home will take a few seconds to read through the instructions. Um, the time allowed for reading through the instructions is included in those 60 seconds and to uh, basically try and come up with what answers you would select. This is roughly um, a, a sort of an emulation of what students will experience in these nonverbal reasoning tests. And in fact, um, you'll be disappointed to hear that these questions are pulled from um, sort of standard 11 plus, that's 11 year old plus uh, nonverbal reasoning questions. So over to the question set and we will start a 60 second countdown. Fifteen seconds left. All right. In fact, uh, these were the verbal reasoning questions. We'll have a look at the non-verbal reasoning ones in a minute. So just to run through the uh, solution and answers quickly, um, if you look on the next slide here, in the first sentence, um, between the last two words, most and aggravating are the four letters ST and then AG. So stag is the correct answer. Um, in question number two, we have gauge and germ uh, completed by finishing GAU with GE and starting RM with GE. And in the last one, we have a hammer is used to drive in nails. So I hope you, you, you sort of get the sense that practice with these kinds of questions would indeed improve your performance um, especially under time and pressure uh, situations. I'd love to know in the chat um, if a couple of you could pop on whether or not you, you got one, two or three or none, that would be interesting. In the meantime, we are going to head over to the uh, next slide where you will be given an opportunity and again, 60 seconds to answer now not three, but two nonverbal uh, reasoning questions. <laughs> Good luck, 60 seconds.
David. <laughs> cool. So we have 15 seconds remaining. Cool, and I'm gonna jump over to the solutions here and, and just spend a few seconds explaining, um, not too long. I don't wanna take up too much time here. So in, in this uh, block on the top left, the first three blocks, um, the top row really are um, very similar to the last three. In fact, the last two of those match. And so you can sort of just pull that down and imagine that the pattern repeats in that way. Therefore, the solution is E. Question two, um, you treat the two uh, objects, the two squares and the line and the five circles as separate entities. And you look at what's happening to them over the course of the progression on the left. And so the two blocks seem to be moving down uniformly, which would put the solution at either C or D. Um, you can select the right answer by looking at what's happening with the circles. And let's focus in on specifically the crosshair circle, not the semi-black, semi-white circles. And that one is moving down uniformly as well. And it looks like where the question mark is, it'll be right at the bottom, which leaves us with the solution C. Lastly, question three, the only correct answer is C. Um, there are always five white blocks, always two black circles, um, but where people seem to get tripped up here is that the two black circles are never adjacent. And so therefore the solution can't be A, it has to be C. Cool, so again, I repeat, I hope this gives you the sense that practice and exposure to these kinds of questions really can help when it comes to, to solving these problems. David, I can see, I can see that you- I, I, I think I would need a lot of practice to do these. These are very tough. <laughs> no question. All right, over to, um, well, yeah. So why, why are they so difficult? As you've seen now, um, unfamiliar question types for students. Competing with students, um, from schools that have prepared them or um, from schools where the culture is to write these entrance tests. And so there's, there, there's a whole subculture around preparation for these exams, past papers, students discussing, sometimes even teachers assisting with the preparation of it. And um, especially if you're going for a competitive school, by definition, entry is competitive. And uh, to elevate your scores opens up a more diverse array of schools which you could gain entry into. Right, so um, how, how would we assist with this? So firstly, they write mock entrance tests in um, very similar test formats to the ones that they'll be writing in their entrance tests. Um, we use that to do, again, very similar diagnostics and identify weaknesses. We work through those weaknesses with a, a trained tutor. And again, that would be one-on-one -on -one in Cape Town and Johannesburg, online elsewhere. I'm hoping that you can't hear the cricket in my office, or at least that it's not so loud. Right, so um, basically why genius? I mean, parents have commented in the past that the, the, the assessment process is convenient. Um, we work with your schedule. Uh, the initial meeting, if possible, is in person, but from there, we're coming to the home and doing the feedback. Um, we're making it as pain-free as possible. When, when it comes to one-on-one -on -one lessons, we match with student schedules, sometimes at the school where, for example, a student was doing opera class. Now that becomes irrelevant, and so a slot is open for a session, or at home in the evenings, or even on the weekends. Um, students will get better entrance test scores and therefore get accepted by more schools and ultimately with the whole program uh, will excel academically in the new school. Over to David um, for some final comments before we move into Q&A. Thank you very much, Dean. I mean, that, that, that for me was uh, quite, quite tough and challenging. And I'm very aware that there's a lot of information that we are sharing with you. And it probably appears all quite daunting, but I think this is where I hope that between myself based up here in UK and Dean with his specialist team in South Africa, we can try to make this process as straightforward and most importantly, right for your child. So in terms of my service, what I can support you with is I can help you to identify the schools that are going to be the best fit for your child, both in terms of their academic strengths, perhaps some of their academic needs, but also all those other areas of curriculum, which are so important to help them to develop. So I can support, as it says, in the application and the entry across the age range and also across the school type. 
I work with a lot of different types of schools, schools which are specialist schools for children with particular learning support, schools that have got a very strong academic reputation in terms of helping to go to the most competitive UK schools. So I hope that that experience will enable me to respond to the needs of your child. We can explore all the possible entry points and working with Dean and the team at Genius we can support to get that tutoring in place to jump over some of those hurdles that we've outlined this evening in terms of the difference between South Africa and the UK's academic year. And most importantly, I hope that I can provide that springboard or that sounding board for issues that you want clarification on at any stage of the process. And ultimately, this is about making this relocation up to the UK as successful as we can. And as a parent like yourselves, we all know that if our children are happy and secure in their learning environment, that is going to make almost every other aspect of this relocation work in the way that I know you want it to. So thank you very much for your time. Dean, back to you. And I, as you say, I think we are going to have a question and answer session now for some immediate questions. But here Dean has put our contact details on the screen for you. So. Any questions that perhaps we can't address this evening, please do contact us and then we can respond to you individually. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. And, and I'll just point, point out embarrassingly that our landline, which is the second number, is 011467, not 567. Nevertheless, all of our contact details are available on our website. Um, JP. I know. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Um, I find it uh, ironic, Dean, that the cricket started whilst I was trying to figure out these questions that you uh, <laughs> that you put on the screen. It reminded me of my own A levels. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, thank you very much, uh, gentlemen. I see we do have some questions. Um, if if I can ask specifically uh, something that that I've been wondering, um, practicing obviously immigration law the whole time, is there a specific school? Uh, David, that, that you've noticed particularly that South African families sort of tend to gravitate towards, or is it sort of all over the show? Well, I suppose inevitably it depends upon where you're relocating to into the UK. I think probably most families that I've worked with are either London based or certainly within the southeast of the UK. And again, what I found exciting is working with different families. I've worked with a family whose son is a very keen judo uh, sportsman. And so we had to make sure that we either had that facility within the school or certainly access within the local community. Um, I suppose, JP, what I found is that sport is really important. Um, and so I work with schools who've got that breadth of academic, but also all of that co-curricular area. And this is where, as I say, when I do my initial consultation with a family, probably I would do that with the parents initially, but very quickly afterwards, I really want to meet your son or your daughter to understand what are those particular interests that they have got. And so that's where I can then guide you towards schools that I know have got a very strong reputation facilities, for example, in swimming. Um, what did test me quite recently was a student, not from South Africa, but from China, who is a very keen ice hockey player. And I had to say, I'm afraid you won't find a UK school that offers ice hockey as part of their curriculum. But we were able to find a school very close to a club, a local club, very keen to uh, have that student on board. So we would respond to those particular uh, needs that each family has. It's very interesting. It's a question I often get. Yeah. I'll just refer to answer to the webinar and for you gentlemen to deal with. Uh, I think, uh, Dean, if you want to pick some of the, uh, the questions and, and we can go from there. Sure. So, um, Let's have a look. Okay, so I have here, um, is IEB matric equivalent to the A-level course, right? So yeah, I, I alluded to this briefly earlier on, but the coming from, so if we, if we talk about not transitioning to a school, but a, but a university in the UK, most, the vast majority of universities will accept a student who has done an IEB instead of A-levels. Some simply won't. Uh, like for example, I think um, Oxford, Cambridge, those are, th that's an example of a school that won't accept a student unless they've done A-levels. But 
it, it's, it's even in the top 10 universities, many, many of them will accept purely IEB. However, academically, um, so, so firstly, you have to understand that it sounds like the A-levels might be easier because there are only three subjects, whereas in IEB schools, uh, we're taking something like six or seven, six if I'm excluding life orientation. And then you might even take more depending on what you're planning on doing after school or how competitive you're, you're planning on sort of building your school profile. Ne nevertheless, a full A-level course even though it's only three subjects, is far more intense and far more taxing. And it requires a much, um, a much more extensive range of knowledge and a much, uh, a much more keen ability to apply that knowledge than an IEB metric would. Really, it, it, it's not true that GCSEs are equivalent to an IEB. IEB, I would put at one year ahead of the GCSEs. And so it really is sandwiched in between that. And so halfway through A-levels, what, what Cambridge would call AS, Advanced Subsidiary, um, or A1 is the, the, the closest analog. And I, if I can just add to what Dean has said, I think in my experience, when I've been supporting students into UK higher education, what we often find is that within a university, different departments are given flexibility in terms of the level of performance that they will deem to be acceptable for degree course admission. So I think with IEB transfer, matric transfer into the UK, there's a lot of discussion to be had with different universities and different departments within universities. Brilliant. Perhaps, uh, David, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I'm just wondering, I see you've got a question about Scotland uh, yeah. and how that differs, uh, if you can maybe address that. Yeah, I mean, it depends. In are, are we talking there about Scottish universities? Uh, I think secondary schools. Oh, secondary schools, yes. I mean, Scotland, as a devolved part of the UK, uh, education in Scotland is controlled by the Scottish government in Edinburgh. So they have a different structure to the UK. So in that respect, there's probably a more greater similarity between what we call the Scottish hires and the IEB. So that's a much broader based curriculum with assessment being done across those subject areas. So if you are thinking of admission into a Scottish school, that is something that we would probably find there's a greater parallel between performance levels than you would find within the UK GCSE and the A-level model. And in terms of applications into UK or Scottish universities, we would then need to look at the requirements from Scottish hires alongside the equivalent within A-level or possibly IB. Um, and then Mr. Roots asks, and I think this is something we get often as well, what are the options for my daughter who will complete grade one this year, arriving early next year, January, February? So for the youngsters, um, how, how would that play out? Um, yeah, can you can again, um, my immediate thought there in terms of grade one. So my understanding in South Africa, that would mean a student who's age six. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, six. Well, that would be entry into what we call year two within the UK system. And again, what a school would want to know is performance levels and getting some very clear evidence from the school that they currently attend to see whether or not they would be able to make that transition into that entry point within the UK. And so I think what I would say with every individual uh, um, inquiry, we would start from what is the age related entry point and then start that discussion with a school. I suppose one of the things that I would say, if we are talking about the maintain sector, one of the factors which I think, I, I'm not sure if it's come up uh, earlier, is that entry into a UK maintained school, for the overwhelming majority, it is dependent upon residency. And so trying to do an application prior to having a UK address, either a purchased property or a tenanted property, so that you have your contract, is going to be very challenging. And I know this sounds very difficult for families coming in from overseas. They would probably look to get the school sorted first and then we'll work out where we're going to live. 
But in the maintained sector, you do need to have that UK address. And again, this is where what I can do is give advice in terms of those locations where schools have got very strong Ofsted um, inspectorate reports. Ofsted is the UK government office for standards in education. And what I can do is guide you through how to interpret those Ofsted reports so that when you've got a geographical area, so for example, if you were thinking of the southeast, so Kent, uh, Essex, uh, Surrey, uh, Sussex, I can then guide you towards those primary schools which have got particular uh, outstanding Ofsted reports. Now, inevitably, schools which are deemed to be outstanding schools, entry is going to be highly competitive. So again, what I would do working with you is to identify where there is potential availability so that we can then direct you in terms of your whole relocation search to those parts of the southeast or whichever part of the country it was where we're going to be able to marry up your needs along those sides a lot along those of your child and getting that entry into a primary school if you are considering admission into an independent preparatory school the normal process there would be an informal interview with possibly the head teacher, some very straightforward assessment in terms of literacy and numeracy, could involve possibly some verbal, nonverbal, but certainly the key is going to be the ability of the school to provide the curriculum that's right for your child and possibly any extra support that might be required. So if I can just jump in here, I mean, this is a common yeah. scenario uh, and it's true, JP, when you mentioned that a student in grade one is either going to be six years old or seven years old, right? Most mm. commonly. And if they're six, they're going into year two. Um, mm. and, and if they're seven, they're going into year three. And I would encourage the parents of the student to go and look at year two and year three content mm. and evaluate that. Um, I mean, very qualitatively, but just compare it to the kind of stuff that you know that your son or daughter is, is capable of doing and capable of working through. And, and more often than not, you'll find that there is a tremendous knowledge gap. And so David's spoken a little bit um, to the logistics of entry. And, and I would just want to reiterate here that certainly um, preparation is going to be needed, uh, or, although there is support um, in terms of, of the school taking the student in and raising them from whatever level they're at to a certain level for a, for a competitive entry and for a student who wants to kind of walk into a school and, and have um, their identity as academically strong, they're going to want to have prepared in advance and caught up as much as possible to the kinds of skills that are required when entering year two or entering year three. And so that can be very challenging. It's a very difficult situation. Thank you, Dean. I think Charlene Martin's got got a couple of questions. Maybe if you can you can address that, that would be great. Sure. So, um, what Charlene says here is, my son will be sixteen in twenty twenty two. Again, we don't have exact um, birthday here, which which means this is not so. Uh, we don't have all the information we need to kind of analyze the situation. But just roughly, if I were to talk through it, um, the student will be sixteen next year. I'm imagining what they mean is sixteen on the first of September. And they'll be in grade 10 in a South African school next year. If they are 16, um, when, when uh, sort of in that 1st of September space, then they will be in the year 12 entry age group. So they will be going from halfway through year to uh, grade 10. And again, this is the common problem, right? Starting year 12 in a school in theory. Um, year 12 is the beginning of the sixth form. Uh, the, the A-level course. And so that's a better entry than, for example, um, the beginning of year 13. It still comes with its challenges. Um, this certainly is a possibility and can be done. Uh, mm. the, the complication here is whatever three A-levels they select at the school, some of those A-levels are likely to have prior knowledge requirements. So for example, if maths is chosen or if English is chosen, the, the expectation on that student starting A-levels is that they have completed a GCSE in that subject. And so they are expected to have to come into A-levels with a foundation set of knowledge, which they just won't have uh, accrued or developed um, in their grade 10. And actually we're working with a boy who's in exactly the situation. They are starting at sixth form college 
for year uh, 12 now in September. Um, and they're in grade 10 currently. And, uh, oh, sorry, they're in grade nine currently. They'll be in grade 10. They'll be starting grade 10 early next year. And so what we are doing in, in the afternoons, basically, as an additional program is in the A-levels that they have selected, preparing them in all of the appropriate pre-work, in other words, to full GCSE level, um, to ensure that by the time they leave, they know everything that their peers would have known going into A-levels. And, and, and in this case, um, and in many cases, it is absolutely possible to do that. So it's not a lost cause, especially if the student um, is an above average uh, student academically, if they're quite strong, then, then this kind of transition and this kind of upgrade is certainly something which is possible. David, anything to add? No, I, I, absolutely. And I think this has been, been you know, where, where genius has been so great in supporting families at exactly that age entry point. There is no question coming into the UK as a 16 year old, you want to come into year 12. But obviously that means a September start. So what you can do is put in support in advance of arrival to ensure that that gap is minimised so that when they start their A-level programme, they are as good to go as the students from the UK system who've done GCSE. So very much so. It's all about what is the preferred entry time for arrival. So with a 16 year old, you do not want to arrive in the UK in April because you would have that gap in that child's education before the sixth form starts in the September. So I think as Dean mentions, and I think I recognize the profile we've, we've heard there, staying put actually within the South African system and then transferring in the summer, um, the, the, the UK summer, to arrive to start the academic year as a 16 year old in year 12 is unquestionably the best route to take. Very much so, yeah. Thank you. Um, could we address uh, Jan van Graan's question? Um, uh, Dean, do you think so sure, so uh, let's just have a look here. I'm looking, I'm also looking at options for my 15 year old twin boys who will be attending a state school. I made contact with a few schools and they basically referred me to the local council to apply. So David, perhaps you could speak to this. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, that's a reference to what I was talking about earlier. Um, UK maintained schools are managed at a local government level by what we call local education authorities and so when you when you approach local education authority the first question that will be asked is your address and so what i think you will find until you have got a uk address either an address of a relative whom you're going to be living with within the catchment area for a school or a property that you are proposing to rent i think you will find that most schools probably will not be able to process the application. So as I was saying earlier, I know this is incredibly challenging for many families coming into the UK who want to get the school worked out first and then you'll work out where you're going to be based. I'm afraid it has to be done the other way around. You need the UK base from which you can then do the application. But that's where what I can do supporting you is obviously within those distances that you perhaps might need for a commute if you're traveling into central London, for example, is then to give you guidance on which areas to look at in terms of where you're going to live and then to use that as the base for application. So that reference there to coming in for, I think you said, Dean, with 15 year olds, um, again, depending on where the birthday is, but 15 in UK terms would be year 10. So that is the middle of the GCSE process. And that's where I would want to discuss all possible options and scenarios, because, again, entry into a maintained school for a year 11 entry is not the um, I, it's not the route that I would uh, recommend. You really want to be looking at a year 10 admission. But again, this is where having that discussion with an individual family to understand exactly what the profile is would be so important. And then, as I say, giving that guidance on the best locations to consider in terms of the Ofsted uh, reporting on schools. Thank you. Uh, sorry, Dean, you want to say something? No, not at all. That's that's exactly right. Yeah. Um, I think my democratic vote, the next question to answer is uh, Charlene's question. Um, David, what uh, what about children who have special needs in learning? So, for example, ADD, ADHD, um, what support yes. is provided in the state schools and how does impact entry assessments uh, if they become applicable? 
yeah, again, I think the, 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 the process of admission into the state sector is handled by local education authorities. Within local education authorities, some will have specialist designated schools, and the admission process there is based upon a referral. So normally a local authority would refer a family to a specialist school, and part of that admission process would be a referral based upon an educational psychologist report in terms of the particular needs of that child. So if you have a child who has got a particular educational need, you've got two immediate issues. Number one is being resident within the catchment area for a specialist school and having an up-to-date educational psychologist report which can be submitted as that referral process. So you would apply in the same way to a local education authority and they would then make a referral on your behalf with that ed psych report to a specialist school. So in terms of what I can do and offer guidance on is depending on the particular need of your child, I can give you recommendations in terms of the specialist schools within the maintained sector that are best suited to meet the needs of your child. And again, in terms of where you're going to locate yourself, those needs are probably going to create a number of suitable locations. But as I said before, what will be um, critical to making those applications is having a UK residence. So you would need to have either a purchased property or a rented property to start that application process. Within the independent sector, the key distinction there, obviously we are talking here about fee paying, but you would not need to identify your residence in advance of application. So in the independent sector, you can focus on what is the right school and ensure you get that offer. And once you've secured the offer, you then backtrack to work out where you're going to live to enable you to access that school. But to come back to the, the maintained sector, all applications would go through a local education authority with a child with special needs. You would need to have a referral, and that would be based upon an educational uh, psych report. Thank you, Dean. I think we've got uh, maybe time for, for one or two quick ones, and then and then I think we should, we're should going to just about run out of time. But uh, if I can be cheeky and quickly ask David, ask you a question. Um, back in the day when I went to the UK, I had to do my GCSEs in, in a year at a, at a crammer, I think they called it back then. Otherwise, yep. the, the age wouldn't have worked out. And that was wonderful coming from Alp Makar School, very Afrikaans, going into... Uh, you know, doing my GCSEs in, in one year, but by the grace of God, I passed. But does that kind of thing still happen? Does that still exist? Well, I suppose the better call would be to, to do it in advance, right? Get as much prep work done as I say and then go. Yeah, very, very much so. And again, if I can just take the independent sector, what you'll find is that there are a variety of colleges and schools that are catering for families who are relocating into the UK. So you mentioned they're doing GCSEs within a year. Absolutely. Quite intense, probably not doing the full profile of 10 or 11 GCSEs, but doing a more bespoke program, particularly geared to what you're planning to do for your A-level studies. So a one-year GCSE course, absolutely. And as I think I mentioned earlier, just working recently with a South African family coming into the UK at the end of this year, we've identified a very good college which is going to uh, support their daughter starting A-levels in January on an 18-month course. So coming That's in tough. in January 22 for assessment in the summer of 23. So those one year or 18 month bespoke courses, absolutely. But that's going to be more within the independent sector than within the mainstream uh, state school system. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, is, is there anything else that you would like to address this evening? I think perhaps just uh, because it has Two likes. We should we should answer. This is a last question, and David, this one's definitely for you. Um, how reliable are the um, Ofsted ratings when considering areas to relocate to, uh, if not looking at independent schools? Well, I suppose we all take guidance and advice from many different sources, and there are certainly those that I can share with families as an alternative to Ofsted. But Ofsted is the national system for uh, um, in, in, in inspection of all maintained schools in the country. Um, 
Ofsted has had at times a bad press. I think the importance of inspection, though, uh, we, we, we could discuss the politics of that, I'm sure. But I think Ofsted is a starting point. Now, within Ofsted inspections, you can have situations where a school is moved into what's referred to as special measures. That might involve a removal of some of the senior leaders within a school, and a school goes through a process of transition and readjustment. So I think Ofsted is an important starting point in terms of your initial survey. But what I would be able to do is to share with you my own perspective from colleagues but also introduce alternative routes to making measure and judgment of a school. The thing about Ofsted is that it is a nationally recognised inspectorate. We've also got the Independent School Inspectorate, ISI, and their reports, again, for the independent sector will provide you with an assessment judgment on the school's ability to meet national minimum standards in all areas of curriculum provision. But there are a whole series of other guides as well. But in the independent sector, for example, in the UK, we have quite simply titled the Good School Guide. And the Good School Guide is a highly regarded um, inspection uh, survey. And certainly schools are very much uh, on their best behaviour when they know the Good School Guide is turning up because parents will look at these as an indication of the school's performance, the quality of leadership, this quality of provision, the physical plant of a school. But this is where what I can do, working with families, depending on your location, I can guide you to a variety of sources of information, but within the maintained sector, I would always start with Ofsted. Excellent. Thank you very much. Dean, I think uh, that's it for this evening. Thank you so much. David, thank you very much as well. Um, the contact details on the screen, and as mentioned earlier, um, the webinar recording will be sent to all the attendees. Uh, Yacinda, uh, behind the scenes, thank you as always. And to everybody at home, have a very good evening. We'll all speak again. Thanks, JP. Great. Thanks so much, JP. Bye-bye. Okay, good evening. Bye-bye.